Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 9, Episode 128. He's Dave Ryan. I'm Alex Kazor, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for tuning in this Tuesday, Steelers Nation. Dave, uh, good to be with you again. Yeah, I know you had a little vacation getaway this past weekend. I hope you had a good time, and uh, welcome back. Yeah, we had a nice little quick getaway. Uh, uh, drove up to Carson City, Lake Tahoe, uh, Reno area, about a seven and a half uh, hour drive each way, but uh, uh, made sure the itinerary was full once we got there. So we got, you know, we got a lot of a lot of things that had been meaning to get up to that part of uh, of the state. You know, since arriving here three years ago, we've pretty much been right here in Vegas, and obviously we, we took a trip out to Seattle and L.A., but haven't really been much of anywhere in the in in, in the state of uh, Nevada. But uh, uh, not that there's much. <laughs> and you know, what, what, one thing we. Went Went to the uh, the state museum there in Carson City, and they had a uh, aerial shot, uh, satellite shot of, of the state at night, and uh, the the lit up portions were pretty much Carson City area, uh, Reno area, uh, Las Vegas area, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you look at the state, and it's a pretty big state. I don't know uh, uh, square miles, you know, as far as it covers, but I mean, obviously, when you look at uh, uh, Nevada on a map, you, you know, it's, it's quite a big big state but obviously most of it is is, is filled with mountainous uh desert like you know terrain and all so I, I that opens your eyes to that right there but i had a good time overall uh outside of the seven and a half hour drive which i kind of think i needed to, to to relax a little bit uh here anyway but uh, yeah i had a good time and now back at it again uh, no time off until february <laughs> get back at it uh yeah you, you took off some good time because not much happened over these last couple of days probably the most interesting thing is some of Juju Smith-Schuster's most recent comments. He was on Adam Schefter's podcast recently talking about James Washington. And I really think at this point we've kind of talked about some of these topics as much as we can. But it is good to at least hear from another Steeler. And, um, you know, obviously you're going to speak positively about somebody, a teammate, not going to ever speak negatively. But Juju did have some nice things to say about Washington's progression and expectations for year two. Yeah, at least this is the kind of stuff that we're talking about right now, right? Mm -hmm. You know, yep. uh, otherwise it's been uh, the tumbleweeds have been blowing through, and there's nothing wrong with uh, with that this time of year. Obviously, nothing to not, not a lot to write about, you know, unless you get an interview or something like this, and it's, it's pretty much status quo. But I mean, yeah, you do like to hear the kind of these things come out of the uh, a new leader's mouth in, in, in Juju Smith Schuster, and that you know uh, that's exactly what happened during his during his uh, podcast interview with. Adam Schefter, he says, uh, uh, and, and obviously heaped a lot of praise on on James Washington. There, he says, when I'm getting double teamed, I know that my guys are going to going to step up, and make those plays. Uh, he went on to say, I'm not doubting none of my teammates, and I just uh, know we're going to make our plays. And goes on to say. Uh, Talking a little bit about James Washington here, uh, kind of kind of started off slow, but figured it out. Uh, talking about his rookie season last year, uh, we know that Dante Moncrief he can play. He's been in the league for about six years, so obviously he's a guy that people are talking about. But if you're talking about a guy, a young a young dude who's who's up and coming, it's going to be James Washington. Uh, he says this past summer, uh, the workouts that we had, he's been doing some amazing things. Uh, and goes on to say he's doing a great job, and I'm super excited to see uh, how he does this year. He's he's our guy that's going to sneak up on everybody. Well, I, I certainly hope that's indeed the case. I mean, you and I identified early on in the off season if we looked at the entire offense and were to to name you know one X factor player on offense who that player might be, and yeah, it's hard not to go with Juju, especially with uh, with with Antonio Brown being gone now. Uh, you expect you would expect Juju to see a little bit more attention in the coverage there. And if Juju can come in, I mean, if uh, James Washington can come in and do the things that that you know he was drafted to do and and be that guy that can make defenses defenses uh, pay uh, deep when they're single coverage, it's going to really really make this uh, this offense once again be tough to uh, to kind of handle. 
we've obviously talked about how important this year is for Washington for his own benefit, you know, for the team drafting him. And, and if you don't see progression this year, then you do become legitimately concerned. But I, I, I tweeted this out, I think sometime early last week, that really James Washington has a big impact on Juju too, because this is a base 11 personnel team, three receivers on the field. And ideally you'll have either Moncrief or Deontay Johnson at the X, A, B's old spot, Juju in the slot, and James Washington at the Z, at the outside receiver spot, generally to the right side. Uh, but if Washington struggles, that's probably going to kick Juju to the outside more, and while he can play there and can play the Z, his best spot is in the slot. So if, if Washington can prove himself as that outside Z threat, it'll let Juju play inside, lose some of the bracket press coverage that you get whenever you play on the outside, and it'll make Juju a much better player. So not only does Washington have to do well for himself and for this offense, I think his success or failure has a big impact on Juju as well. You know, looking back at some of Mike Wallace's uh, uh, stats, you know, obviously last night they showed that Green Bay versus uh, uh, Steelers game from uh, what 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 season was that? Two thousand and was that two thousand nine season? Rookie season yeah. for Mike Wallace, I believe. Uh, and that season he had thirty nine catches during the regular season for seven hundred fifty six yards. And uh, two thousand ten and two thousand eleven. And 2012, you know, his final three seasons in Pittsburgh, he averaged something like 60, I don't know, 67 catches, uh, uh, right at probably 1,000 yards over the course of those three seasons and like nine touchdowns. Uh, we would be ecstatic if James Washington hit hit those kind of average numbers. I think that's asking, that might be asking a little bit too much. What is realistic for James Washington in the second season? Well, I think we talked. Didn't we talk about that a week or so ago? You had some projections. I, I, I know we did with Moncrief. Yeah, I, I know we. I know we broke Washington. it down kind of hard with with, with Moncrief. I, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, did we did we kind of come up on uh, with with something for Washington? I thought we did. I I can't remember exactly what we had, but I, I um yeah again I I I remember saying that to me it's less about the exact numbers, but just are you making some impact plays down the field? If he can do maybe one impact play downfield a game or one every other game. That's kind of what I'm looking for with him. It's just someone that can stretch the field vertically, make enough big plays that defenses have to respect it, and it'll open up everybody else. I mean, that's just kind of the, without putting a, a number to it, just the idea of what I want in James Washington. And Lord knows he's going to have his chances, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or should, because, you know, as we pointed out just recently, you know, a lot of times when when, when, when Ben would see A.B. singled up on the outside, or, or really, you know, Martavis singled up on the outside, uh, you know, give that kind of high sign and attack, attack that kind of stuff. The, 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 the bad thing about Martavis, especially in, in really his last season, uh, uh, with with the Steelers, where it just didn't seem like him and Ben were on the same page together. You know, mm-hmm. we didn't we didn't see the amount of field stretching plays out of Martavis that we that we kind of thought uh, that we would have. Now, uh, you know, will we see those kind of plays out of James Washington? We'll see. The the good news is, and and it sounds like a broken record here with James Washington. At least we saw those kind of things late last season. You know, so yeah. hopefully a good good thing to build on there. Uh, I obviously am. I mean, I'm, I'm 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 bullish on him, but I, you know, I'm I'm not Reggie Wayne bullish on him to that degree. I mean, I love love nothing more to be be uh, uh, be proven wrong. And James Washington have the kind of you know 60, 70 catch season for a thousand yards and and eight touchdowns. I'm not expecting it in this offense, but I mean, if he could hit the 40, 50 mark, boy, he'd be be running laps. Yeah, uh, again, just if some of those can be a big place, that's what I'm looking for with him. Uh, anything else from that, Dave? Or you want to move on? I think that was everything, really. That, yeah, that I, 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 I don't, I don't think he really had much more to say during. I mean, he had, he had obviously a lot of things to say during that interview. Talked a lot about, I think, video gaming and uh, being the ambassador over there in England. But I, I think that was that was pretty much the bulk of uh, what Juju had to say. Let's move on to some of the rookies, uh, some of the rookies maybe we've talked about a little bit less. Uh, obviously, guys like Devin Bush and Deontay Johnson, they really kind of captured the, the spotlight, and, and rightfully so. They're, those are guys that are likely to have the biggest impacts year one. But Tom Meade's on some good film room articles uh, the last couple of days on some of these rookies. And, and I want to start with Isaiah Bugs. And he has an article uh, from a couple of days ago on, on Bugs. And, and we know that there's potential. There's some upside there. You know, he was a good pass rusher last year for the Crimson Tide. But Tom did point out potentially a bit of an inconsistent motor. And I think that that's common for a lot of defense alignment. And when you get to the NFL and particularly the Steelers, 
you find out pretty quickly that inconsistent mo- inconsistent motor and playing time don't mesh together. You got to be a guy that plays hard every single down. So as much as we can talk about the development of, of, of a player, you know, from a technique standpoint, the motor and the effort is going to be one of those underrated things that you have to have if you want to see the field. Boy, you better be able to run after that football, right? Yep, the old John Mitchell. Uh, and it, it's the same under Carl Dunbar. I mean, that, that's a requirement. Yeah, and we'll we'll see how how quickly they can get that straightened out. Look, I mean, they they, they you know Dun, Dunbar knew enough about him ahead of this draft anyway, uh, and you know they, they knew enough about him that they still took him. So that mm-hmm. that's that's a positive sign there. Obviously, when you look at the you know the the uh, the the measurables on him, uh, the arm length, and and some of the other things there, you can see why he lasted as long as he did. I mean, he was only a two year player at Alabama. Uh, on top of it, but I mean, you when when you do, and one of the things I looked on, at, at with him early on was his, his was his sack reel, and it's it's not bad. You know, it, it really isn't bad, especially uh, how he had had to win sometimes on the inside there. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see if he can do that at the at the, at, at the NFL level. Now, uh, you are hopefully going to probably he's going to be the one you would think at least ha- right now stands to have the best chance to be the number six guy, the the, the new LT Walton, uh, if you will, the guy that probably isn't likely to dress unless injury happens early on uh, in the season, but. One one thing that we never saw out of LT Walton was was and and, and Keith Butler you know talked about this and I think John Mitchell a little bit as well too really wasn't much of a ha- pass rusher you know mm-hmm. uh, didn't didn't know how to attack half man situations well and, and things along along those lines and I I think if there's one thing that that's a positive when it comes to Bugs is is he's a much better pass rusher coming out of college than than what LT Walton was. So, you know, this is a guy that that hopefully, you know, may, maybe during his, as early as his rookie season, you know, you can get on the field in some certain situations there and even some pass rushing situations to help, you know, save you some wear and tear on a guy like uh uh you know on, on Hayward and and, and obviously to it and Maybe to some degree Hargrave. Yeah, I, I don't know about that. That might be pushing it unless Bugs really comes on strong. But but I I just want to make it the point that I'm not overly concerned about Bugs's motor. And I think it's a good thing to point out. I think it's a critical thing to point out. So I think Tom did a good job to shine a light on it. But I just think it's a common issue for a lot of defensive linemen. I mean, Hargrave had that. When, when, I, when I looked at Hargrave coming out of South Carolina State, I mean – one of the only real issues I could find in his game other than the obvious competition jump was just that he needed to run in the football. And that was one thing that I remember John Mitchell clear as day saying whenever they drafted him. You know, Mitchell said, we like this kid. You know, we don't do small school a lot, but this kid really impressed me. But he's going to have to learn how to chase the football. And he has. I mean, he chases it as hard as Hayward and Tuitt do right now. So I think that just being in that environment, like you said, Dunbar, knowing him, them already having that rapport, that relationship. And then you just go into an environment where Hayward and Tuitt, who get paid so much, still do the little things and still chase after the football. And they all do. I mean, it's, it's not just the, the top guys, you know, LT Walton, not that he's here, but he chases the football hard. Uh, Alulu chases the football hard. So they all go after the football. And, and I think that's just infectious. When you see everyone else doing it, you know you have to do it too, or you're going to be the odd man out. So I'm not worried about it, but something we'll definitely have to watch. You don't think it's something, I mean, if Dan McCullers makes his team again, which, oh boy, I mean, here we are all these years later, we're still talking about Dan McCullers uh, uh, mm-hmm. on the 53. Year. You don't think there's a chance later on in the season that a guy like uh, uh, Bugs dresses over, over McCullers? Well, I think Bugs could dress, sure. I mean, I think he's going to offer more versatility if they do really view Bugs as a bit of a nose tackle type or someone that can play more of one and three tech. That's possible. I just the idea of him coming in for Hayward and and Hargrave and I'm and, I'm, and, I'm talking late in games. You know, hopefully games that the Steelers well, are, are up on. Okay, you know? yeah. If, if there's a you know, if it's a blowout situation, maybe that's different. But I mean, obviously you're going to have such a big talent drop off from from Hayward and to, to Bugs. You know, I just. Can you justify that? So, yeah, I think Bucks could have a small role. I think he could see, you know, 50 to 100 snaps total throughout the season. You're that, playing that's, a lot, that's a lot of snaps. 50, yeah, well, 50, well, 50 over a season. I mean, if you're getting some blowout games. Um, Johnny Maxey played 50 in a season, you know, and over a couple of weeks, uh, the one year back in, like, 2016. So I, I, I'm just pitballing numbers. I, I, I'm just, the point is I think he could play, but I think also is going to be pretty limited. Wasn't that the year that Hayward went down injured? Maxey? Um... Good question. That sounds about right. I don't remember the timeline exactly. Boy, did he have that many snaps that season? 
Maxi? Maxi? Yeah, I remember that because I was doing a UDFA study. I'm pretty sure. It was like 52, I want to say, is what he had. And they came in like, mostly I think they really came in one game. I think the finale against Cleveland where they rested starters. So it might not have been the Hayward injury. But, okay. yeah. So, but, but I mean, we like Bugs' chance to make this team, right? It's hard oh, to see. Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, where we're sitting at right now, I mean, unless a guy like, and look, Casey Sales, I mean, there, there's a little bit of talent there with Casey, right? I mean, more uh, run defense, yeah. yeah. I don't know what the pass rusher, and they they brought Greg, Greg Gilmore back, so they saw something they like to to bring him back a second time. Right. I mean, this isn't just going to be obviously handed to a guy like uh, sure. Bugs, but uh, you would think that you know what we've seen so far, or, or, or uh, obviously on his college tape so far, we'll see what the reports are out of out of uh, training camp, and obviously watch him in the preseason and all. But you would think Bugs has a good chance of making this roster. Yeah, yeah, I put it at, at, at much higher than the typical six-round pick, just based on roster construction. Another study that uh, Tom did was on Benny Snell, and we've talked about Benny Snell endlessly for you know his power and some of his background stuff and the fan favorite things and all that's been really interesting and important. But Tom kind of took a different angle, and I'm glad that he did. We looked at Snell as a receiver, and yes, the tape there was pretty limited. I think he had maybe 30 career receptions at Kentucky, I believe 17 last year, and they were, you know, relatively quick game, screen game, check down, stuff like that. But, you know, it was good to kind of get a gauge of where his hands were. And I thought going through Tom's post, you saw Snell kind of be a natural catcher, which is pretty surprising for a guy that didn't do it that much. I think he's got soft hands. I think he, he doesn't have too many bad drops. He focuses on the football well. He gets upfield pretty quickly. So I don't know if you saw the post, Dave, because I know you were away, but any uh, evaluation of Snell as a receiver? Yeah, I, I did watch it, and, and obviously, ha- you know, I'm the one that did the post, too, on, on the pass protection with him. So I got to see a little bit of, of the pass catching when going through, breaking down uh, that portion of his tape, you know, several weeks ago. The thing is that, that uh, he he does look like he has soft hands. Uh, he t- he does seem like he uh, does a, a good job of tucking the football uh, away right away. Uh, not much burst afterwards, <laughs> though, mm-hmm. right? I mean, he, he's not a guy. And look, you know, I, I did a post on this as far as breakaway uh, runs. That, you know, uh, being low in that area. I mean, he's, he's obviously not a James Conner when it comes to running with the football and, and, and breakaway runs. And I wouldn't expect him to be a guy that's going to make a lot of people uh, miss out in space uh, after catching the football, he'll try to run you over. What it was what he'll try to do, and he'll probably yeah. have some success uh, with that. Uh, uh, with his size and all, especially some, some some smaller you know defensive backs and things like that. But uh, I think one of the big takeaways from me was a uh, you know he 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 does have some soft hands there, uh, and he does have some experience of, of working his way through the line uh, and getting himself open for those little quick running back screens. But the second piece of takeaway was, man, this guy isn't going to run away from you. No, but I kind of do like the idea in one way of a big power back in space. If he's one-on-one with some of these smaller defensive backs, I think he could some do some damage. So he's never going to be a big threat. But, I, you know, if, if you had to throw to him, you know, you're not holding your breath is kind of how I would describe Snell out of the backfield. Say, say my, again? You're not holding your breath every time you throw the football. No, 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 he, no. He, 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 Right, right. He he looks competent in that area, and he, look in, in in the pass protection as well too. And those are two things. If he if he's able to show that early on, it's going to help him get in on the field a little, you know, a little bit quicker than normal. You know, mm-hmm. uh, and obviously there will be a there'll, there'll probably be a key situation or two. You know, like we saw with James Conner back when his rookie season. I think that was what uh, week five against the Jaguars. He didn't necessarily pass his test uh, right. or, or early on with him. Uh, there's going to be a situation or two, I think, when it comes to Snell after that first quarter of the season, where we're going to get a chance to see if he can pass that test. And uh, I, I, I like what I saw as far as the effort goes on the pass protection, uh, his ability to eat up grass. And I, look, I mean, you're going to be the one to see it first first right out of the shoot here at training camp here mm-hmm. with the uh, with the backs on the backers, <laughs> you know, you know, yep. kind, kind of drilling all like that. I think this guy is going to be uh, going to be an interesting one to hear about, especially if he gets thrown, you know, in, in the bull in the ring situation with a guy like Vince Williams or, or something along uh, those lines. I, I think he I think he'll probably rep- represent himself uh, overly well. And once again, you know, you look for that that key moment or two early on. During the season, and by early on, I mean after the first quarter of the season, I don't think we're going to see a lot of, barring injury, a lot of Benny Snell 
on the field, you know, first quarter of the season. But I, I think after that, you could see him in some spot duty uh, from 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 uh, that point forward. Look, I mean, who who would have thought we would have saw Jalen Samuels right. get get any kind of amount of work that he got last year? I mean, obviously the Le'Veon Bell thing played a, a huge huge role in that. But even so, you know, he he still didn't play that much. Until James Conner, you know, went down later on in the, in the season with the ankle injury there. So never say never when it when it comes to these guys getting on the field. Post Bell, you have to feel better about Steelers running back depth this year compared to last year, don't you? Because after you realize Bell wasn't going to be around for at least some amount of time, you knew he wasn't going to be there week one until obviously you eventually found out he wasn't going to show up at all. I mean, you had Conner. Stephen Ridley and, and a rookie Jalen Samuels. Now this year you go with Connor with another year under his belt, Samuels with a critical year under his belt, and 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 Snell. I mean you have to feel better about that overall, don't you? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, Le'Veon Bell is still never got talked enough about while he was in Pittsburgh. That guy could pass protect, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just talking about the whole group as a whole. Yeah, 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 pass protection. Yeah, right, right. I, okay. But but uh, if there's one thing that 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 if there are two characteristics that that really stuck out with Bell, was his ability to pass protect, and his ability out in space catching the football. You know, mm-hmm. his ability to make those guys make make the first guy miss. Uh, those were the two things that that really, you know. Uh, uh, I, I think are, are attributes that, that Steelers might miss to some degree. Uh, but when, when you look at uh, obviously what Connor has done all of last year, uh, Jalen Samuels coming in and, 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 and you know playing reasonably well during his time late last season, and then what you see on Benny Snell coming out of college, yeah, I mean, it gives you top to bottom as far as the depth chart goes. You know, Toussaint, had you know when they had Tucson on there, he had certain attributes. I mean, he's good, good in pass protection, but I mean, when you keep going back to you know, want a strong, you know, making sure to point out that Tucson was a strong pass protector, he wasn't much of anything else, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, top to bottom, though, depth chart wise, this is probably the best since I don't know. Well, obviously, with Bell and and D'Angelo, and who was backing yeah. up those two. Uh, at, at it, the time, was it Tucson? Like Watson, or Tucson, Ter- Terrell Watson yeah. get in there for a year. I mean, and, and to go back to that really quickly, I, you know, I know that Snell's not going to have a big role. I could still see him having a role immediately. I mean, look at what Terrell Watson did. You know, he impressed that goal line drill and can't make the team. Um, you know, his kick returner and a short yardage guy. I don't think Snell's going to do kicks, but I think he could be week one against New England. Could I see him getting a carry on third and goal? Sure. If he has a good preseason, good camp, I think he can have that niche role right away. I don't see any reason why to wait a month in, into the year for that. Yeah, well, here's the thing, Jalen. I mean, there, there's, some things don't, some things that are not broke don't need fixing, you know. What uh, do you mean? Well, James Conner was was good down low, you know, especially in the red zone area there. So, mm-hmm. you know, not saying that 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 he has to have all the work down there, but I wouldn't I wouldn't expect I'm not expecting a huge seismic shift in any situational part of the game really uh, in the first quarter of the season. Now, I think as the season goes on, you could see maybe Snell get some work in, in those situations. Personally, I'm not expecting him to, to 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 see many snaps at all early in the games of the first quarter of the season. I mean, I'm not either, but I don't know why you have to wait. You know he's a power guy. I mean, and, and I get, yeah, if Connor's good to go, he's your guy. But if it's a 10-play drive, Connor's carried it six times, and it's third and goal, and he's gassed. You know, I put in fresh legs. So it's not that you take Connor out because Snell's better, but you take Connor out because Snell's fresh. And he's a power guy. I mean, you know, there's no there's no mistaking that. I think you, you know that pretty quickly. And if he does well in the preseason and shows that stuff, why wouldn't you use him right away? I mean, what are you going to learn in week five that you didn't already know in week one about this guy yeah, in that we, regard? Well, I mean, once again, you have to, he has to be competent in, in all situations, you know, to get on the field. So we'll, we'll see. Well, yeah, but I'm just, I mean, like a third and goal. He doesn't have pass protections. It's okay right. if he doesn't, doesn't do it that yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, look, I think we could see it. I just don't think we're going to see a ton of them during that, yeah. during that well, first, I, first I quarter. I mean, just naturally how many opportunities are going to arise for those short yard stuff early in the year where Connor could be spelled. I mean, yeah, it's going to be maybe five snaps over the first quarter of the season. I just think it could happen because, you know, that's what you brought him in here for. And I think he can do that roll out of the gate. Everything else may take time. 
but top to bottom, I mean, this unit, you know, then add in Rosie Nix, you know, uh, as as a fullback in those situations, and and yeah, top to bottom, this this is a good or appears to be a nice group of uh, running backs slash fullbacks. Dave, I don't know where you want to go from here. Uh, Spoos had their birthday yesterday. Just want to touch on that briefly. They turned 86, found on July 8th, 1933, by Art Rooney Sr. for $2,500. So just uh, a note there. Uh, really cool piece of Steelers history on that. Uh, Matthew had an article. He's done a couple articles, actually, the last couple of days. Just kind of some, some open-ended questions about who are the maybe some of the greatest receivers of all time or greatest players of all time or, like, the, the third greatest of all time because so, for some positions – like quarterback, and I want to start there and ask you, Dave, we know who the top two quarterbacks are of all time in Steelers history are. You can order them however you want. You can have a big debate about that. I'm not interested in that in the moment, but you have Bradshaw and Ben as one and two. Again, order it however you'd like. Who's the number three, I think, is the more interesting question that Matthew posted. Um, and, and I would go Bobby Lane, clearly, but I don't know if you had a different opinion on the third greatest quarterback of all time. Well, the thing is, too, we don't have a lot of, you know, not a lot of tape to go on with Bobby Lane. You know, yeah, but I mean, I, mean if, I think a lot of football history historians know how good he was, both in Detroit and Pittsburgh. Boy, old Joe Gilliam had an arm, man. <laughs> yeah, he had a imagine, great arm. And, imagine what would have yeah. happened if that would have worked out that way, you know? Or, uh, poor off-the-field choices, unfortunately. Right. Uh, but, boy, you go back and look some at some of these old clips of, uh, of, of, of Joe Gilliam. That guy could sling it. I'm here yeah. to tell but, you he could sling it. Do you imagine if you had a quarterback battle like that today where you had three guys, Bradshaw, Hanratty, both first-round picks, and Gilliam, you know, who was his great talent, just, just battling it out, neither of them doing too well early on? That'd be quite a story. Boy, you – I, I was never, uh, you know, hand ready to, to, to these, to this day. I never saw really the, uh, the attraction, overall attraction to him, sure. you know? No, I get that. But he was, uh, he was, he was a first or second round pick, right? Second round, wasn't he? From Notre Dame. And he was a null pick, right? He was 69. What year is hand ready taken? Yeah, right, right. I think it was, uh, no, 69. Yeah. Uh, second round. right, right, right there early first year. That was one of Noel's first guys, really. I, right. I think, yeah, 69, uh, right second at, round. Right yeah. after the Dick Shiner uh, years. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of funny that the first quarterback that Noel ever drafted wasn't Bradshaw. It was Terry Hanratty, who obviously didn't have an NFL career. Right. Uh, wow. Uh, you know, where, where does Neil O'Donnell fit in, in all this? Yeah, that's a good question. I know most people obviously remember him for the Super Bowl interceptions, but I mean, he had a good, he got him there, helped get him there, and had a good, good run. So that's a good point. Cordell Stewart, some other people would point out about him potentially being that guy. You know, outside of uh, o- O'Donnell's first season uh, in Pittsburgh, where I think he was something like two and seven or or two and six as a uh, uh, as a starter. You know, from from ninety two on, I mean. He, you know, he produced the wins. You know, they had the mm-hmm. nine nine and six season in nine ninety three, but uh, uh, boy, whoa, that uh, couple of years there, I I thought you know they had a, a better chance or it should have went to the Super Bowl. Obviously, one the one year that they did uh, in 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 the ninety five season there, but uh, uh, where does he fit in all this? And you know, even though it was brief, we t- touchdown Tommy had a had a nice little short run there. But I mean, he, mm-hmm. I, I I think he's way behind uh, yeah. a guy like Neil O'Donnell. And say what you will about Cordell Stewart, you know, slash. Once you got the once once you got once you learned how to defend him a little bit, you know, uh, against the run and make him make him be more of a a pure passer. That's when things caught up with him a little bit. I thought, you know. Yeah. So if you uh, had to go with one, are you going? O'Donnell? Or yeah, I think I, I think I might go O'Donnell there. You know, as far as guys that we've seen a lot of tape on, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm still going Lane. Uh, I mean, I, I know the Seals got him at the back end of his career, but they weren't good, and Lane was one of the best players they had. And I'm just trying to figure out if he was a better quarterback or drinker. I think it was a pretty close, uh, pretty close contest. There's actually I was watching on whatever they're calling Root Sports these days. Uh, did you ever see that? The, it, I think it just called the Chief the play that was. I think it's been done and redone once or twice. Uh, yeah, well, days. actually, I have the DVD of it too. Oh, you do? Okay, yeah. so you have seen. Yeah, I was. I, I hadn't really seen it before, but I watched uh, most of it the other day, and, and there was a segment where they were talking about Bobby Lane, and and it had some some nostalgia feels. So, so I, I would go Lane. Uh, maybe even Jim Fink is number four, but but O'Donnell I think is, is has a good case to be made. 
Uh, O'Donnell, during his five-year career in Pittsburgh, 39-22, and 22, uh, 57.1% of his passes, 68 touchdowns, 39 interceptions. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I don't think it uh, – yeah, it does have his adjusted net yards for passing attempt number here. Of course, like. that's the first thing you would go for. Yeah, 5.62, uh, which which obviously isn't great. Uh, but back then, I mean, how many how many quarterbacks did you have over a seven uh, adjusted NEA through mm-hmm. – through right. those five years there, so uh, uh, you know he's always going to be remembered for those for those. Uh, uh, and you know you, the further you get from that though to those those Super Bowl ints, you know, I think one uh, I think the second wasn't the second one the the the, uh, the miss signal on on, yeah. on on the route adjustment there. Yeah. Uh, you know it's easy to put it on the quarterback, but you know the further you get away and the more you you hear about. Uh, first-hand uh, uh, recounts of, of of those, you know, not all of it was on O'Donnell. The only frustrating part is this should be a much different and better answer with all the quarterbacks they've missed out on over the years. You know, Dan, passing on Dan Marino, Marino yeah, right. trading or cutting Unitas, trading Len Dawson. I guess trading Sid Luckman, that situation was always kind of weird, but either trading the pick that took Sid Luckman or trading Luckman's rights. I mean, they've had so many guys that, that you know could have been Steelers that they missed on, and that would have totally changed the, the scope of the franchise. Who was the one? I was just uh, – who was the one right around Dick Shiner? Uh, and Landry called him the best uh... – the best young, best rookie quarterback uh, in in the league. Rattle off some of those quarterbacks there in '67. Said he was a Steeler. Yeah, he was a Steeler, and he got hurt. And Dick Shiner, I think, had to take over. Oh, why am I drawing a blank? I can on look that? it up. Uh, um, I, I probably I don't quite know. I think it was like '67 Steelers. Okay. Uh, hold like on a, here. I'll and he got hurt, like a Greg Cook situation out in Cincinnati. Uh, let's see. Kent Nix. Kent Nix. Kent Nix. Uh, he was a, what was he? What did, uh, what did Landry have to say? There's a recount or in one of these videos, uh, uh, this week in the NFL, they were hmm. qu- quoting Tom Landry saying something about the, the best young quarterback. Uh, Tom Landry called Nix the best rookie quarterback he had seen in 10 years. Wow. And this hmm. was what? What year was uh, Nix's rookie season? Sixty-seven. Sixty-seven. The year before I was born. Uh, so there you go about Nix. I mean, and, and look for for that for that to come out of Tom Landry's mouth at the time. You mm-hmm. know. Uh, now Nix, I think uh, I think he had a, a couple of injury things, and then obviously uh, Noel came in in uh, what sixty-nine. Nine. Yeah. And you know, went went his own direction there. But uh, I found that interesting when I came hmm. across that 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 bit of information. That is, Nicks. yeah, I, I didn't know too much about Ken. Nicks. played three years, did not play well, but no one on that Steelers team played well. All right, so so good good discussion there. Uh, what about running back? I thought running back was interesting too. You know, you got you got Bettis and Franco one and two, but who's the third? And I thought Le'Veon Bell, as much as he may not be liked in Pittsburgh, I think he may be that third place guy. Yeah, I think you have to put him there. I mean, what? If this guy would have uh, kept his wits about him and 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 stayed in Pittsburgh, and you know stayed healthy and 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 not suspended, what what would you know what kind of numbers? I always envisioned this guy being, you know, uh, better than than Eddie George, you know, uh, mm-hmm. as as time progressed uh, early on in his career. I mean, when you look at his early numbers and start matching them up to guys like like Eddie George and and some of the the better all-purpose backs we've seen in the league to date you know you kept thinking wow you know did this guy if he you know if he stays healthy and is able to play a long time you know potential hall of famer I think yep. I mean uh the, the the drawback is always to me the, the the one big drawback has always been with Le'Veon Bell is just not the ability to to home run yeah you know, uh, uh, with, uh, especially with, with runs from the scrimmage. Now, he could obviously break off the explosive play, you know, a- after the catch. And, and, hey, you know, I don't care how you give me the explosive plays. Just give me the explosive plays. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's hard to name someone other than Le'Veon Bell, 
you know, as that number three guy or whatever. And well, and, you have you have fast Willie Parker, Rocky Blyer. You still taking Bell over those guys? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, me too. Yep, I think Bell's the guy. I mean, beyond that, I mean, <laughs> you're uh, it gets kind of really jumbled after that. I think. I mean, yeah, look, one look, year. I mean, Barry Willie, uh, Willie. I mean, Willie in his prime. I mean, you want to talk about a guy who could bust a home run for you? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it was him, and you know, longevity. You know, look, Terrell Davis is in the Hall of Fame, and he didn't have that 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 long of a career, right? right I mean, he right. did did win a couple of Super Bowls and and uh, along the way there, but uh, yeah, I, I would put Le'Veon Bell where, where we have him. All right, and the last one I'll ask you of that topic: the greatest receiver in Steelers history, and that might be the toughest one of all to pick the the number one guy. That that because you got you got a ton of options. I mean, all time. All time. I mean, how can it not be Antonio Brown, really? I yeah. mean, am, uh, yeah, I know. Look, they, we're talking about, and that's what gets me when you talk about quarterbacks and all like that. I mean, different errors, man. I mean, you really have to take into account the the rules of the game at the time and, and, and just what the quarterbacks were, were expected to, to, to do at the time. You know, yeah. Uh, just looking at different eras overall and pure receivers. I mean, look, I grew up in the time where Swan making those those highlight film catches, you know, uh, especially against the Cowboys. But uh, the things that, that we saw Antonio Brown do, I mean, we're running out of superlatives to, to use, you know, with some of the mm-hmm. things that he did. So I don't see how you – I, I mean, no disrespect to Swan and Stallworth and 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 those guys, but I mean, just all around uh, wide receiver and and the things that the cat, kind of catches that he made. I just don't see how you don't put Antonio Brown number one. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I think he summed it up well. Uh, as much as we may not like how things ended with Pittsburgh, obviously when he was a Steeler, I, I think he's, I think if he were retired today, he's a Hall of Famer. There's no doubt in my mind about that. I don't know if you feel the same, but I think that just speaks to how. How good he is. Uh, who is the most maybe uh, uh, under, uh, uh, underrated wide receiver throughout the years? I mean, Louis, Louis Lips, when he played, I mean, he, 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 he got I mean, he got plenty of respect during that time, right? Yeah, but he does get lost, I think, in the overall scope of the history because he came out right after Swan and Star Wars, so he kind of gets overshadowed. Yancey Thigpen would be another name I'm sure other people would look toward. Frank Lewis had a really good Steelers career in an era where they didn't throw the ball a whole lot, and he was right before Swan and Star Wars gets traded to Buffalo, one of the fastest players in, in, in team history. And what about Roy Jefferson? Oh, now you're talking my language. Yeah, if he wasn't if, you know, one of those guys that, that – you know, had some, I guess, off the field issues, and old traded him to the Colts. And uh, you can go way back to Jimmy Orr, Buddy Dial. I mean, those are some some big names from from the fifties uh, that were big play receivers. Let's see here, uh, receiving single season uh, receptions. I mean, obviously Antonio Brown. And look, I mean, no, we have not forgot about Heinz Ward. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But you know, we 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 always had the conversation every three months. It seems like about Heinz Ward. I just think it's going to be incredibly tough, I, even with them opening up these uh, these additional spots and all like that. You know, which most of them are going to uh, right rightfully go to uh, to uh, uh, you know the, the senior players. You mm-hmm. know, uh, uh, next year when they when they hopefully do the class of twenty, I it's just going to be so hard for Heinz Ward to get in. I mean, yeah, I understand they created the rule for Heinz Ward and all like that. I mean, granted, I mean, I wouldn't, wouldn't trade Heinz Ward, Ward, Ward for the world back when they had him. But it's just the further you get away from his career, the harder it is to me, I think, to make make uh, uh, make a make a legitimate hard push for him to get in. You know, especially when he's going to get kind of bottlenecked between his era's receivers and then the ones in in who came after him. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Calvin Johnson, I think, is eligible next year. I mean, he's getting in before Heinz Ward's getting in. I promise you that much. And then Yancey Thigpen, I mean, it's another one. Uh, great, great Steelers wide receiver, obviously. Uh, you look at uh, – uh, let's go on down the list here. Uh, Roy Jefferson during his – How many years did Jefferson play for the Steelers? Four? Five? Uh, five in total. Okay. All, 199 receptions, so just short of 200 receptions. And for a player to average 40 receptions, 
a season for five seasons. That's that's pretty. I wonder what what span was that? That's 1965 to 1969. Mm-hmm. Uh, fill some time here. I'm gonna pull up some. Uh... Yeah. Well, he was a great player, but when Noel came on, he was one of those guys. I mean, obviously, Noel basically turned over the entire roster. Sands, Andy Russell, and one other guy. I think I'm missing. But Jefferson, he got traded to to Baltimore because he didn't like, I guess, Jefferson's attitude or something about him, and you know, just cleaning the house, changing the the culture of the team. And Jefferson was one of the first big names to go. Let's see, six, sixty-five to sixty-nine. I, I want to see who led what 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 led the league. Well, Jefferson led the league in receiving in sixty-eight. It looks like one thousand seventy-four yards on only fifty-eight receptions. Had eleven touchdowns that year, uh, according to Pro Football Reference. I'm just looking at his career stats, and then uh, had a, a, a one thousand seventy-nine yard season for the following year. I'm trying. Let's see, combined seasons for sixty-five to sixty-nine in the NFL. Uh, let's see. You had Lance Allworth had, uh, 326. He's in the Hall of Fame. Charlie Taylor had 301. He's in the Hall of Fame. Don Maynard, uh, had 291 catches during that span. You have to go on down 15th overall during that span of years was, uh, Roy Jefferson with 199, uh, 199 receptions during that span. Yeah, he was, he was a vertical threat. But I'm sure he didn't play with nearly as good quarterbacks either. I mean, he was playing with with Dick Shiner and Kent Nix, so that I'm sure that hurt him a little bit. 29 TDs during that span of of uh, 65 to 69, average 18.45 yards per reception. That's pretty strong back then. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the better players of that of that decade, but Noel didn't like him and, and he dumped him. All right, uh, where where to now? Uh, I think the only thing I have left before we get to some reader emails is just, you know, we're going what'd, to what'd our... you think of, what'd you think about that old clip of Alan Fanica from LSU? That oh, how cool yesterday. was that? Yeah, that was Ian Wharton that, that posted that with some Fanica. I, I never really saw any Fanica highlights in college before, so that was, so that one screen pass where he trucked the dude and ran downfield <laughs> for that long screen. Uh, get Alan Fanica in the Hall of Fame. I know the LSU highlights don't matter, but come on. Can let's go, man. He should get in. Uh, you would hope the 2020 class and, and say hope. that every year, though. That's yeah. my concern. I feel like it's like we see that every year, and it just it feels like we're getting almost farther away in one. I, one I sense mean, of it. When, when you, I mean, no disrespect to Kevin Mawai, you know, but when if you if, if you put a guy like Kevin Mawai in last year, Fanica has to follow that this next year, has to, yeah. Yeah, I, I sure hope so. Uh, but but uh, speaking of Fanica and the offensive line, it's a good time to transition to we're kind of our, we're doing our positional recaps and overviews and training camp uh, previews. We're talking about the whole offensive line today, Dave. So I'll just start with let me lump the starters in right away because or at least four of the five. We'll talk about the fifth spot probably more in depth. But you got Villanueva, Foster, Pouncey, DeCastro. The training camp goal is just stay healthy. No Ramon Foster scares like last year is the only thing I really care about. Yeah, I mean, from top to bottom, and we we talk about you know is, is Alejandro Villanueva, you know, one of the one of the most underrated left tackles in the league. I think you can make a make a push for that. I mean, he's obviously no Joe Thomas, but he's become quite a technician. Uh, I have no problems with that guy playing playing left tackle for me and starting at left tackle. Uh, Ramon Foster, the, the the word that we've used over the years with him is just the most consistent. Uh, uh, probably the most consistent player on the Steelers' offensive line, at least in the last three to four years. When it comes to him, uh, can he even pull to the right if you need him to? I mean, it, it, it kind of looks painful to watch sometimes, <laughs> but but he gets the job done uh, that way. Uh, very so, he's so hard to get around. Uh, in, in, in pass protection, uh, works well with uh, Villanueva. Bless his heart, all that uh, uh, all that signaling and tapping the pouncy that he has to do, those knees of his are not going to be in great shape <laughs> five, five years from now, having to keep doubling over and looking back at, at, at Ben, a great communicator on the offensive line. So now you're just waiting to, you know, I, I think when the drop-off happens with Ramon, it's going to be severe, you know. And it'll be certainly noticeable when it happens. It hasn't happened yet. Hopefully it ha- doesn't happen this season uh, with him. Uh, David DeCastro, what can you say about him? Easily a top five overall guard in the, in, the, in the league. I don't care what side you choose, left guard, right guard. I mean, just top to bottom. Yeah, he's got his kryptonite 
uh, the Geno Atkins and the uh, who's the guy from the Eagles that gives them uh, Fletcher Cox. Yeah, yeah uh, kryptonite for sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they all have their kryptonites. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, but those two seem to be, you know, when DeCastro isn't playing either one of those two, he seems to be fine uh, there. Marquise Pouncey still probably one of the top five easily centers and athletic centers in the league uh, when it comes to his play. And then, you know, here we are, we've, we've named four of the five. The question is who's going to be the right tackle this year. And, and yep. that, that, you know, uh, uh, barring everybody's play staying, remaining the same as it's been the last several years, uh, you know, they should be fine. You know, be interested to see who obviously grabs that right tackle spot. Uh, Fighter Chukwama, Okorafor did a great job uh, there last season there when, when asked to play there. Uh, who's going to grab it this year? We'll see. But uh, top to bottom, yeah. I mean, and, and their backups too. B.J. Finney is a guy that, boy, I – I have no issues with them starting at either guard spot. I'll tell you that. You know, my my, my biggest concern when it comes to B.J. Finney is him having to play, uh, you know, start a game uh, and multiple games at center, just because that hasn't been as better better of the positions there. But I mean, yeah, put him at either guard position, and quite honestly, the little bit that we've seen out of Filer play at guard too, I have no issue with with him. I don't think at, at guard right now either. So top to bottom, this seems to be a very a very, very good uh, offensive line, and it'll be interesting to see some of these younger pieces come in and try to battle for, for the, the, the one or two remaining spots there on the depth chart. Dave, I'm going to I'm gonna tell your wife that we're going to edit your tombstone, and on there we're going to put B.J. Finney, good guard, not as good at center. Like, it's every time you talk about Finney, I mean, that's I know what you're going to say with him. But, but I mean, I, I, I agree. I just think he hasn't played center as much well, as we, he's we just guard. Have, we have We haven't seen it. You know, yeah, and yeah. and and, go, and what we have seen it's been against the the like the Ravens, and he didn't fare overly well in there. You know, the whole timing thing and all. Ben talked about that, I think, as well too. So, uh, is it his fault that he hasn't played a lot at the position? No, and, yeah. and and maybe if he does, and here's the thing: do we really want to see more Finney at at, at center right now? No, because that means uh, that means uh, Marquise Pouncey's down. You know. Sure, sure. But I, maybe they need to do more in camp and preseason with him at center. Get him some more work there. That might be a good idea. Well, I mean, we've seen him over the years. I mean, uh, what? Uh, how much? I'll have to go back and look and see. Yeah, I don't know what the charting at, is. At center last year during the during the preseason there. I mean, we're going to see him quite a bit of him. I mean, uh, you, yeah. don't, you don't need to see Pouncey during the preseason. None. No, you don't need to see Foster either at this point. What are you, what are you doing with 33-year-old Ramon Foster in the preseason? Um, so, yeah, I, I agree there. Yeah, it, the, the, the comfort is for the off- offensive line as a whole is that it's going to be fine. It's going to be a strength of the unit regardless who wins that right tackle job. It's going to be a, a good battle. Competition brings the best out of yeah, the whole room. And whoever's the best man for the job is going to be given that job. It won't be just handed out. It'll be earned. And that's what you want in the offensive line. So I think Fowler's still taking the first team reps right now. You know, Corfo will be in the mix. Hawkins, I think, is a distant third, but he's still in the mix. So, uh, yeah, the the strength of this team is the offensive line. You have Derwin Gray, you know, seventh round pick. who's probably going to be bound to the practice squad, but we'll see what he can do and compete. He's moving around a lot. So um, then you got, you know, backup guys like Patrick Morris is interesting. Uh, Zach Banner's still here. So, you know, you have Fred Johnson, I think, is an intriguing player. Garrett Brumfield, two UDFAs from this past draft class. I mean, there are there are a lot of options and interesting players that I can't, can't wait to see in Latrobe. Fred, Fred, Fred Johnson, mostly right guard. Is that where he was at Florida? That's yeah, correct, right? he was right guard, a little bit of right tackle. Um, he's big. He's 6'6", six, six, so a little taller than most guards. But uh, he may play a little bit of both spots on the right side. You know, Garrett Brumfield is a guy that, that seemed, uh, you know, had he not – had so many injuries in college, where would he have gone, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the draft? I mean, is he, was he going to be a fourth or fifth round guy? You know, because in some of his tape, he looks like he can move, man, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, it's hard to say with the injuries, but he was a big recruit. I mean, I think every school was, was trying to get him to commit whenever he came out of high school, and I think he was a four- or five-star recruit uh, coming out and didn't have the best career because of the injuries, but, you know, he's a, he's a, a nasty run blocker. He's got a great demeanor. They called him the bruiser, a smaller guy, but not a bad athlete, and, and I think we had this conversation before. You know, you put on some of his tape from his senior year, 
or yeah, he was a senior. Um, it wasn't great because of the injury, but I think if you look at the year before, you have better tape out there. So it's kind of like Jerrell Hawkins. You know, he came out a year early that junior season. I think he had a foot issue, really kind of you know probably impacted his tape and his performance. But the year before, he was really good. So whenever you got in the rookie camp that first year, he looked really good because he was healthy. And so you might get a similar thing with Rumfu, where just him being healthy is all he needs to really showcase his true talent. Come come preseason time, we're going to see a lot of these uh, a lot of these second and third teamers, obviously. But and it's probably familiar, fam, you know, us being just fam, more familiar with them than than across the league with what teams have. But you know, top to bottom, the back end of this offensive line depth chart doesn't look too bad on. You know, on, on paper and obviously college tape where, where we've only seen most of these guys play. So, I mean, we're going to see a lot of core four during the preseason. Probably going to see a good bit of banner. Hopefully, Gerald Hawkins right from the get-go is able to go. Uh, Gray, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Prince, obviously, another kid out of Maryland. I mean, that these guys are going to log, log a lot of the snaps during the preseason, and I'm expecting this overall top to bottom of this line to to to, uh, to perform quite well. Yeah, and, and I said before, that'll really help out the quarterbacks too and let you have a better and cleaner evaluation on the progression of Josh Dobbs and especially Mason Rudolph heading into his second year. And you got Patrick Morris, who I really like coming to TCU, J.C. Hossenauer, uh, AAF guy that I think got some second team run in the spring. So watch out for him, you know, just getting some more. Because if you're second team, you're getting some, some decent reps. If you're third team, reps are really hard to come by, especially in games. So there's a big difference there from a, an evaluation standpoint and a rep standpoint, second versus third team. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, again, like you said, I think every everyone's probably talking about their, their sleeper offensive line guys. But I think top to bottom, it's, it's a, obviously at the top it's great, but I think there's some good depth here as well. Is Fred Johnson the guy that uh, uh, probably going, you know, as far as the non-draft pick obviously goes with, with Gray? But, I mean, you, you would expect to see a little something out of him. But is Fred Johnson probably the uh, the undrafted that, that will get the most attention early on? That's my thought, and we'll see what happens. But right after the draft, when they first showed who the undrafted players were, I said Fred Johnson's the most talented guy of that group, and he was probably the one guy that I thought had a chance to get drafted of all the UDFAs this team brought in. So I think he's the most interesting one. Now, it doesn't always work out. Sometimes someone else steps up. I mean, once you get to camp, who cares about what your draft profile said? But I think he's the one that I'm most intrigued by, yes. Big kid, too. Big kid. Yeah. Yeah, six six with long arms. Play, you know, he's like filing. You know, he play play one side. He can play right guard, right tackle. Was probably going to be what Fred Johnson does. He probably won't play. He's not going to play left tackle, for example. Maybe left guard, but he might be a right guard, right tackle kind of guy. Yeah, definitely going to be interested in watching him. And Patrick Moore is another guy that 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 you've been more of, I think, a little bit more of a fan of than I have uh, from from the get go. But I mean, he ought to log a lot of time at center this year. Yeah, a little disappointing camp last year, but made the practice squad and, and kept around. I wish I was still bummed they got rid of RJ Prince. I was really kind of excited to see what Prince was going to do in year two, and now he's down in, in Baltimore. But I'm sure they made a decision for, for some good reason. All right, so uh, top to bottom, not, not, not a bad group, that's for sure. And I still think, last note, uh, I still think Gerald Hawkins could be, you know, showing tape to make the team for himself, but I still think he could be putting that tape out there for, for some other team. And I think a trade with him is not out of the realm of possibility. Especially like get they put put some good guard tape down. <laughs> yeah, he probably <laughs> shut up. Uh, he probably will play guard though. I think he will get because we heard the report that, that and just because there are so many tackles, you know, you got it's hard to get everybody playing time. It, I think you probably will see Hawkins at guard a little bit. And for, in, in order for him to make this Steelers fifty three this year, uh, he, he I think he's going to have to show a lot of position flexibility. Obviously, he's going to have to stay healthy. Right from the get go, he needs to get healthy because I don't think he's at 100 yeah, percent yet. I mean, That's the he, concern with him. He needs, needs to get there and stay there. I mean, if there's if there's one guy that we might be worried about opening up on active pup here in a couple of weeks, well, two and a half weeks. This time can't t- yep. tick away quick enough <laughs> right now. But uh, yeah, if there's one guy that we're kind of worried about maybe starting off on active pup, it's him. You know, and mm-hmm. that that's he he. To me, he can't afford that. You know, he's got yeah. to come. He's got to be healthy right out out of the shoot here. And obviously, coming off that injuries, that's that's a that's a nasty injury to have to come off of uh, on on top of it. And man, you just uh, uh, he's going to have to really show that position flexibility. 
yeah, and, and, and be good at, at every spot that he plays. I mean, if he can do that, you could you could theoretically carve out a spot for him. But even then, it's tough without an injury. And if there is a lack of mobility coming off that torn quad, maybe playing a guard might help him where he's not playing in quite as much space. I'm not sure, but maybe that's going to be a good thing for him ultimately. We'll and, have to wait and, and see. And like I, and I, I, I get tired of, of talking about, but I, right from the get go, I always thought that, that, that him moving inside playing in space was going to be his best option there. So, Why was that? Was that because I thought he was a good athlete? I I, I didn't was... I didn't see him be able to to uh, to play the levels well, and, and you know just some people just can't master the uh, you know not, not as good out on the edge. I just I saw him playing being a better guy that could play in space. I mean, obviously I like the athleticism because I, I think he's the kind of guy that you could put on the move with uh, with running a power and all like that. I just I wasn't overly impressed. Too much with his ability to control the edge, though. I, I going back okay. and thinking back yeah. uh, at his LSU college take there. All right, fair enough. Uh, Dave, anything else you want to talk about before we get to some reader emails? Uh, no, uh, no, but I am quite excited about watching this offensive line play during uh, during the preseason here. Yeah, no, it'll be and again if they play well. Everyone else is going to get the, a chance to showcase their talent because Mason Rudolph. I mean, I went through Mason Rudolph. He got sacked seven times last year. I think on six of those, he was just scrambling for his life, you know, just because there was a blown protection or someone, you know, couldn't block some, you know, defender or whatever. And it's hard to evaluate your quarterback when he's just trying to not, not die <laughs> and, instead of trying to make a throw. All right, uh, from Brett Nile. Uh, Brett, poor Brett's been trying to get in. Uh, Brett, Brett's a wordy fellow for us. Uh, yeah, we got uh, some time today. Yeah, we got some little bit of time here. Hey, Dav- Dave and Alex, one quick discussion point. I know you both are into exp- exposing truth over myth. We're, oh, I guess we're like the myth, the Steers Mythbusters. Did you ever watch? Uh, do you? <laughs> oh, watch? I love Mythbusters. I, I love yeah, I still watch a little bit of yeah. it. Yeah, are they still going on. They're still going on, aren't they? They got they like done? a they got like a new cast now. I think. Do they? Oh, yeah. that's lame. Uh, let's see. Uh, I want your thoughts on, on this one that is being propagated, uh, on the NFL network, among others. The idea is one first put out there by John Madden and has now been picked up by others. The myth is, is that the Raiders had, had the Raiders got the break on the call. They believe it was trapped uh, during the immaculate reception. Then the Raiders would have won four Super Bowls in, in the decade. Uh, he says to me, that is in, insane as it completely ignores the real reason for the dynasty, which was not a fluke play in the winter of 1973, but the draft of 1974 in that draft, they got Lynn Swan, Jack Lambert, uh, John Stallworth and Mike Webster. That's four hall of famers in four rounds. They also got a DB and Jimmy Allen who had 31 career interceptions, most with Detroit, but did have five in 1977. And, of course, Donnie Shell should be in the Hall of Fame, in his honest opinion, as a, as a uh, 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 undrafted free agent. Uh, he says, I believe that unprecedented infusion of talent took that team from good to great and is a real reason they became the four-time Super Bowl champs. Am I being grumpy, old man, or am I right? Your thoughts. He says he'll be shaking his fist at the sky while waiting for the answer. Look, I mean, that 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 draft that, and you want to talk about somebody that needs to be put in the Pro Football Hall of Fame is Scout Bill Nunn uh, mm-hmm. because of, you know, the, that draft specifically, you know. Uh, I mean, would the Ra- – I guess what he's trying to say is, 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 is something's being propagated around right now, the myth that had the Raiders – had the Steelers not had the uh, immaculate reception, that it would have been the Raiders that would have went on to win four Super Bowls in 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 the 70s decade. And I don't know how you can just say that based off of one play. And then and I think Brett puts it right when you look at that draft there. Look, I mean, both those teams were were powerhouses during that time. But the Steelers' defense, man, was the thing that really set 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 them apart. You know, and yeah, the Raiders had had John Matuzak and boy, go through the names: uh, Ted Hendricks, uh, uh, Jack, uh, Tatum. Jack Tatum. Wow. Uh, George Atkinson. Yeah, was was yeah. yeah I he, think George was George was there uh, during that time. Yeah, I mean, both those teams, but but uh, 
you look at you look at that Steelers defense, man, top to bottom, and that to me, that along with combined with with, with you know Bradshaw and Swan and Stallworth, and obviously Franco Harris in the running game, uh, really really helped made those 70s, 70s teams of the decade. So I don't think one play was the reason why the Steelers went on to uh, to uh, uh, be the team of, of of the 70s and not the Raiders. Yeah, I mean, I agree wholeheartedly. I really hadn't even heard that idea. I mean, I, I imagine there's some mad Raiders fans about that, but I don't yeah. think it's a mainstream thought. Have you heard anything about that? No, I haven't heard. And, I, you know, obviously the Steelers in the immaculate reception, they didn't win at all that year. Yeah, that was my point. Yeah, 72. They didn't They didn't go. It's like saying, you know, the Steelers would have had five Super Bowls in 76 had they not had Franco and Rocky hurt against Oakland. I mean, that's just, you know, we're just trying to rewrite history. So, no, I think it's anyone that makes that point, it's just, just being silly or just an angry Raiders fan. And what year was the Mike Ren? What was what year was the Mike Renfro? Uh, uh, I'm not. What are you referring to? I, the, I don't know. The, the 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 one that should have been probably should have been ruled a touchdown. Uh, the, that, holy, uh, the, the holy the Ghost. No, 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 no. You don't holy remember? Uh, 1979. Okay, that was the 1979 uh, game. Uh, no. What? I, tell me about that one. Boy, just Free. Google it. Okay. Uh, right. And tell me if you think that was a catch. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Is that a playoff uh, game or something? Yeah, that was a playoff game. Okay. Uh, I believe so. Hold on. Yeah, that was a playoff game. Uh, let me pull up when exactly that was. Was it the 80 AFC? Uh, I'll have to pull that up when exactly that was. Uh... <sighs> That was the on January 6, 19th, 1980. Uh, Pittsburgh and Houston played in the AFC Championship get that game. Uh, and that was when the Mike Renfro catch in the back of the end zone happened. That probably should have been ruled a touchdown. The Steelers obviously uh, went on to win that game and, and scored another touchdown in that game. But that was a big play in that game. Okay, gotcha. Uh, yeah, I will check that, check that out. All right, uh, let's see. We got more. I didn't have my email open when you started talking about this. Let's see. Oh, no, we got a few more in here. Uh, Paul Brown writes in Steelers 86th birthday. Love the podcast. Follow you, follow you both on Twitter. Alex, great content on Twitter. Dave uh, loves to stir the pot with great content as well, too. Uh, to my question, with the Steelers celebrating their 86th birthday today, I like to look back in the previous decades and see how we got to this point where we are now. Specifically, I'm asking for the best player, only one player in each decade in Steelers history. Wow, that's a you know, that's yeah. tough, to, uh, tough to do. Uh uh, let's see. I have a list of mine below, albeit I'm not as sharp on the pre no era as there are many Steeler fans. Uh, I love the input on the Steeler, Steeler's history buffs. Uh, let's see. 1930s. He has Byron Wizard White. Uh, I know it was for only one year, but there wasn't much success in that decade. Would you say, uh, Bill, uh, Byron, uh, uh, Weezer White was the, the, the player of the decades of the thirties for the Steelers? Yeah, I mean, he was probably the best player, but he only played for the one year. I mean, there's got Johnny Blood McNally. There was somebody else. I know David O's talked about. Um, ah, I can't remember what his name is, but uh, I mean, from from a talent standpoint, Wizard was was the best. Yes. Paul Brown here has in 1940s Bill Dudley. Yeah, a first round pick, little little tiny dude from from Virginia. You can't argue with that one. 1950s Ernie Stotner. Hard to hard to disagree with Ernie and. Uh, what, mm-hmm. year, what year was Ernie? Did Ernie come into the league? Fifty, fifty, I think. Uh, nineteen fifty. Good, good memory. Second. Well, round I just, I just wrote about him the other day, so that's the only reason why Out I know that. Boston College. Uh, nineteen sixties. Interesting. Andy Russell. Jefferson would be an interesting one. We just talked about Roy Jefferson, but yeah, I mean. Russell was, I mean, it, Russell was kind of weird because he was a really good player in the 60s, and then I think Noel took him to that next level whenever he came on board. But, uh, yeah, no argument if you want to go with Andy Russell. Uh, Bobby Lane still. What uh, about John Henry Johnson, too? Uh, was he a 50s, 60s guy? It was worth throwing out there. Andy Russell, 16th round draft pick. pick wow. But, but, you know, you look at that, and it was pick 220 overall. <laughs> so <laughs> Okay. A little different. Yeah, not many teams. Back then. Yeah, the, the number of teams skews that quite <laughs> a bit. Uh, 1970s, uh, Mean Joe Green. Uh, he has 
1980s, Mike Webster. Uh, no disrespect to Mike Webster, but could could Donnie Shell be kind of the the? I mean, we're talking about guys of the decade. I mean, was was Mike Webster the the the, the Steelers player of the decade in the 80s? I mean, you could pr- mm. probably talk about Dermonte Dawson in there. What, what, what about year? Louis Lips too? What, what time did what, when did Dermonte Dawson come in at? I think he was later. Uh, yeah, it had him in late late eighties. Uh, well, yeah, Webster started basically every almost every game in the eighties. So. Oh, Dawson Dawson came in nineteen eighty eight later later in the eighties. Yeah. So uh, well, you could do Webster. Webster, Louis Lips, show how show played till when eighty four. Like eighty seven, wasn't it? Was it that long? Yeah, you're right. Eighty-seven. Okay. Did he did he start all those games? Yeah, he started most of those games. Remember, yeah. Remember, because that's when I mean, if you want to make a push, you know, one of the things that that aggravates me the most when when people talk about Donnie Shell is they keep trying to lump him in and say, well, he was just part of that great, you know, Steelers defense in in the seventies, which he was. Mm-hmm. But go go look at go look at uh, Donnie Shell's stats stacking up, you know, after that fourth Super Bowl and on. You know, yeah. uh, that's why I think, you know, that's why that's why I think call hall voters, you know, they, they instantly want to say, well, you know, we how many of those guys from that 70s defense can we throw in there? You know, because, uh, you know, and, 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 and weren't some of them great just because of the defense that they played in. OK, but Donnie Shell was was a great player. I mean, a one of the league's best players. From that fourth Super Bowl on, so you know mm-hmm. that's the thing that gets me the most when people uh, they they keep trying to lump. So I you know I don't know. I mean, can, can, Donnie's. I think yeah. No, like I said, no disrespect to Mike Webster, but I think you could make a stronger case for maybe Donnie Shell being the player of the eighties. Yeah, yeah. That's a, so. Would you go Shell if you had to pick out of all those things we just mentioned? Just off the top of my head, I think I would. All right, I can go. I I think I might still go Webster, but I won't argue on that. Uh, 1990s. Rod Woodson. Yeah, Carnell Carnell Lake probably was still Rod Woodson. Uh, 2000s. He has Troy Polamalu here, and uh, look, I, I mean, if you don't have, is it Troy or is it Ben or is it yes? Is it Co? <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you yeah. I mean, at I some go point Troy. you got to put Ben in here, right? Yeah, I was thinking Troy in 2000s, Ben for the 2010s. I know you could still go AB for 2010s, but I'll go just to to give them both. I'll go Troy in 2000s and, and Ben present day decade. I mean, they had their, their two Super Bowls came, you know, prior to 2000. Yeah, all right. I mean, sure. Ben's Ben's two Super Bowls came prior to 2010, right? Yeah, well, Troy was part of those too. I mean, could we go? Could could, could we go co uh, mm. co players hey. there? Ben and Troy. Hey. I think you gotta choose. I'm gonna make you choose. I don't know. I'm going. The... I guess I'm going Troy 2000s, Ben for 2010s, just so they both have it. Well, he's got uh, Antonio Brown here for 2010s. Yeah, I, and that's fair too. But I think Ben's got to have it somewhere. So that's kind of the, the mental gymnastics I'm, I'm doing. All right, good discussion there, uh, Paul Brown. Yeah. And... Armin Nikolai was the 30s guy I was thinking of. By the way, played like eight years. Played from 1934 to 1942, and for the NFL in those days, that's almost unheard of. So what, what was the name? Armin Nikolai. Ah, oh, that's it, one. Uh, that, that's yeah. a, tell, tell me a little bit about him. That's that's a that's kind of a newer newer one for me. Yeah, well, I mean, he played yeah, 30s. He was one of the, he was played on the 34 team, so the second ever uh, edition of the Steelers then Pirates. So David O, I think, knows more about him than I do. But just he played for that whole decade pretty much. Which, well, no one did. The roster turnover back then was was incredible. So just for like he played that long from a longevity standpoint, uh, there weren't a whole lot of recorded stats on him. He was a kicker. Um, I'd have to go back on the history of it some, but but again, he, he just played longer than almost anybody of that time. So that makes him kind of interesting from that standpoint. All right. From Kane Hookstra writes in, forgive my ignorance, but could you explain the term Yenzer? I assume it refers to natives of Pittsburgh, but what is the origin of the term? Uh, well, Yenzer is the, is the Pittsburgh way of saying you guys. Uh, a Yenzer is, in my, I mean, I guess it, the, the definition v- varies. I mean, can Yenzer can just mean somebody from Pittsburgh, but the way I kind of use it as a jokey way is the Yenzer is the, 
the the mad you know foaming at the mouth guy you know yells at the refs all the time and fire Tomlin after every loss and you know just just the overreactionary part of the fan base that exists for any fan base you know what I'm saying the ignorant <laughs> yeah just like just everyone's drunk uncle is is a yinzer in my my frame of mind yeah I, I uh, to me it's all of it rolled up in one uh, mm-hmm. you know kind of a native Homer. Uh, right. uh, kind of, uh, uh, no, knows, knows all, you know, uh, gets into every argument about, uh, you know, wants to be able to say that he, he can name all these, uh, Steelers, great Steelers of the seventies, but, but only knows like five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just go on Facebook, go to a Steelers group and you'll find out what a Yinzer is. Uh, we, look, we, we, we have fun with it all the time. I mean, mm-hmm. I guess, uh, uh it can be both derogatory and uh, praise, I guess. Right. You know, right. it has multiple meanings. I guess it it all depends on the context in which you are using it in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was uh, it? Uh, let's see here. I, I think that's got uh, most of them here. Hold on. Yeah, I think we we've, we've gone through the ones that I can read that don't have bad language in them here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Alex. Uh, obviously, we got a uh, kind of you know uh, going to be a quiet week the rest of the week. We're going to hopefully have uh, our buddy John uh, John Eisenberg on to co- who covers the Ravens on the Friday show, so we'll be able to kill a little bit of time that way. Uh, we are almost two weeks away from the start of training camp. Yee woo! And uh, let's see, uh, we got the All Star game tonight. Uh, that'll give us something to watch. But tomorrow, tomorrow being Wednesday, is actually the slowest sports day in in the ESPYs or something tomorrow night. Well, I can see that's why it's the slowest sports day because I will not be watching the ESPYs. Right. Uh, I mean, Josh we, Bell in the starting lineup for the Pirates tonight, which is yeah, cool. that'll be something to look for there. Uh, yeah. The the, uh, the home run derby you know, was was uh, as usual kind of fun to watch there. All those balls jumping out of the ballpark looked like they were juiced and all. Mm-hmm. But uh, in the meantime, uh, we will be back on Friday once again. We'll, we'll, we'll preview the Ravens. We'll see what else. Uh, probably going to be a quiet week. At least we hope it's going to be a quiet week for the Steelers from here on out at some point here i don't know maybe we'll see a uh, contract restructure here in the next couple weeks ahead of the start of uh training camp here but uh in the meantime you can follow me on twitter at steelers depot you can follow alex on twitter at alex underscore kazora follow the show at terrible podcast email the show the terrible podcast at gmail.com if you like what we do and you want to donate to the cause go to steelers depot.com hit that donate button up right navigational bar if you want a year subscription to steelers depot.com ad free go to the site and hit the ad free button on top of it uh top uh, upper top uh, right navigational bar and until friday as always thanks for listening to the terrible podcast with dave and alex